All right, well, we're going to get started. Um, you know, one of the things that is the, the great joy of this house is the, the culture of honor that we have. And I just feel so honored in this pulpit, such an honored place that people have valued and esteemed. And it actually, um, you know, it's honoring the anointing of God. And so he speaks uh, so powerfully. And uh, one of the shifts and the things that we're really trying to cultivate uh, is being a multi-voiced multi community where we're recognizing the manifold grace of God that he uniquely deposits through different gifts that he gives to the church. And uh, this week, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, I don't want you to share. Uh, I want uh, Susanna to share. And uh, we've been given, uh, yeah. We, uh, she, she's a gift, and she's been given a beautiful mind that God has anointed to uh, get in and, and wrestle um, with things and really has a teaching anointing on her life. And I think specifically in this season, we're wrestling with the word of God, how to engage with scriptures, which can be an uncomfortable process. Um, we, it, it just, uh, I'm really thankful for Suze and her story. And, and she's wrestled with a lot of discomfort for a lot of years, um, truly. Um, she's like wrestling in high school with things I didn't even know about. Um, and uh, you'll hear some of the story, but I just think this is a pertinent word for pertinent season. And let's honor Suze as she comes to preach God's word and communicate the heart of Jesus. Wow. Thank you guys. Man, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Wow, okay, well, I am excited to continue this conversation tonight that we've been having about the Bible. And I'm going to be straightforward with you. I'm also very intimidated, and I have been all week since I found out about this on Thursday. Um, <laughs> I've been intimidated because I really felt like the Lord wanted me to share part of my story with you. And it's not, well, maybe it should be more often, but it's not very often that somebody who's a leader at a church gets up and says, hey, I really struggle with the Bible. And I'm just going to be really transparent with you tonight. But this conversation that we've been in as a church community is so vital to the health of our church. It's so vital to the life of this church. And I really feel like the Holy Spirit in his kindness has kind of taken us on this journey where we've been reminded of the importance of engaging with scripture, not just on a superficial level where we hang out in the kiddie pool of the Bible and we kind of splash around, which is fun, but it's superficial. But on this level where we wade into the currents of God's grace that are available to us in this book. That's the season that we're in. And I know it's been said from the pulpit several times, but if we want to be a community that is moving in the power of the Holy Spirit, we have to be a community that is deeply rooted and grounded in the word of God. So that's our mission right now. That's where we're going. And Pastor Jordan has done a really good job of bringing up some questions that we should be asking when we're engaging with the text. And, you know, obviously we can engage with the Bible as a devotional tool, and that's beautiful and important, and we should not kick that out of our lives. But there are questions we can ask that will help us understand the Bible more that will then help us have understanding and bring that so that we can answer the questions of our age, which are prevalent. And so those questions are things like, what was the Bible saying to the original audience? Who was the original audience? What does the Bible mean for us today? Essentially, what's the point? And then we've also been reminded in the last couple of weeks that there are tools that are available to us as Western 21st century Christians that we should not take for granted. Like, I can pull out my iPhone and I can look up the Greek root word of a, of a word in the New Testament in 30 seconds. That is wild. So the fact that we have resources that are available to us in that way means that we really should be responsible consumers of the word. And that's our, that's our mandate. So I, I've been processing this um, just kind of what our church is going through as a community, and then also in light of my own story. And I am guessing and just kind of anticipate that there are some questions and some responses that might be rising to the surface of people in this room. And I assume that because they are things that I've experienced. So if I'm the only one, then I'm so sorry. I'm about to waste 40 minutes of your time. But I, I really do believe that there are people who either have wrestled or will wrestle with some of these things. And two reactions I just want to cover. The first, I'll go over quickly. It is possible that when we start talking about engaging with the Word of God on a really, you know, academic, deep, let's get into the text level, that there are some people in this room, and I've been there, that might see that as a little bit boring. Like, that kind of feels like dry toast, a little monotonous. I'm sorry, we're going to go and we're going to read commentaries about this one verse for like five hours. 
I would rather go to a coffee shop with a nice atmosphere and drink my cold brew and have my fun blue highlighter, which I love using, and have coffee and the word and be done with it. And you know what? That's beautiful and that's awesome. And I don't say that out of jest, like just a little bit, but like I do that too, okay? <laughs> but, but this is not dry toast. And I just want to encourage you, if that's you in this room and you don't really like reading, I'm in seminary and I don't like reading. I'm being fully honest, okay? But I like reading the word. And the reason is, is because it's, it's not like dry toast. It's nourishing to my bones. Psalm 119 says that the Bible is sweeter than honey to our lips. And we have to get to a place where we wade through all of that, like this seems kind of boring, to where it really does nourish us. And we recognize it's more like steak or honey or something good that you like. <laughs> So that's one reaction that might be coming up. If that's you, you're in a crowd full of friends because I'm sure we've all been there. The second reaction is something that I want to spend more time on tonight because it's something that I've really experienced throughout the course of my life. And that is that as we start to ask questions about the Bible, as we start to read commentaries and look at the cultural elements that are involved and look at the original audience and look at these things, All of a sudden, we start to recognize potential inconsistencies in the text, and that can be really confusing. For example, we look at portions of the Bible that talk about slavery, which Jordan has mentioned before. There are areas of the Bible where it seems like it is saying that slavery is okay, and that can be really confusing when we look at that at face value, right? Things kind of seem like culturally regressive. How is this Bible supposed to apply to us if it's so culturally regressive? Another thing we might look at is see things that are offensive in the text. Like we look at the Old Testament and there are people carrying the Ark of the Covenant with the presence of God and it starts to fall over and Uzzah reaches out to to catch it and then he just drops dead. That is so offensive to me. That is so offensive. Why would God, I mean, we could, I'm not going to go there, but that's offensive, right? And that's, that's a challenge. And so we start to look at these things and see these inconsistencies. And then we start reading these commentaries written by all of these commentators on various portions of the Bible. And they're all writing on the same text and they're all saying radically different things. Like things that these conclusions cannot be coming from the same text. How is this possible? And if you're anything like me, what starts to happen is all of these thoughts start to kind of like crowd into your mind and crowd into your reading of the Bible. And then all of a sudden you have, it's like Babel, like Babel, all of these different languages. And it's all very confusing. And it's unfortunate because this book, which is supposed to be the authoritative word of God in our life, ends up feeling a little bit shaky. And it's like, how am I supposed to stake my life in this shaky ground? I don't know what to do with that. And so Like I said, I'm going to share some of my story. It's going to be vulnerable, and I I think I'm just going to leave it there, and I I want to pray, and then I'm going to get into my testimony. So if you guys can just bow your heads with me. God, we just, we trust you, God. We trust you, and we thank you that you're in this room and that you're guiding this community into a deeper love of your word. God, I thank you that you've called us to be a community that moves in purity and power, that moves in wisdom and revelation, God. And so I just ask that you would, you would guide me as I speak, Father, that you would just uh, make our hearts just ready to receive what you have for us tonight. So we thank you, God, for who you are, and we turn our eyes to you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, so I was raised as a pastor's daughter, which was really fun. Actually, my mom's in the house tonight, and she was an incredible mom, and she was an incredible pastor. And just to give you a little bit of a setting for the kind of environment that I grew up in, just to set the scene a little bit, my church was this backwoods, charismatic church in northern Idaho. And it was the 90s, and so we did a lot of things like have these really big velvet banners portioned around on the walls with the sticks, right? And they would have inscription like the line of the tribe of Judah. And then when the Holy Spirit got really crazy and really fell, we would grab the banners off of the wall, and we would march around the sanctuary like walls of Jericho style. And it was powerful. It was so powerful. And so I grew up in this really awesome environment. I I always love that story so much. Um, I grew up in this awesome environment and also with parents who are really good teachers of the word, which I'm incredibly grateful for because I know this isn't everybody's story, but I was gifted with the opportunity to know the word from a pretty young age and to have access to it. And things like VeggieTales, right? How many of you watched VeggieTales? So many people. VeggieTales really did, yeah. Here's the thing I found out about VeggieTales yesterday. I kind of came to the realization, finally. 
VeggieTales is brilliant because not only did it teach a generation of children to love the Bible, but it taught a generation of children to love vegetables, <laughs> which like, that's amazing. Kudos to the people who created that. And I wish I would have found that out earlier because I feel like I got duped my entire life. But yeah, VeggieTales, and then the other thing I kind of laugh about are those the felt boards. Do you remember the felt boards? Yeah, so there'd be like felt board Jesus, and he'd be walking around in the felt board background, and then all of a sudden there'd be felt board sheep wandering away, and he would leave the 99 to find the one, and it was really fun, and I really loved felt board Jesus. But I grew up with like this really rich and, and beautiful uh, place of access to the Bible that I really loved, and um, also my dad, he was really into apologetics. He wrote his dissertation on apologetics, which is defense of the faith. So he knew a lot of things. He still does. He knows a lot of things about the Bible. And I was in ninth grade, and he would, like, pepper these things into our conversation throughout dinner times and things like this, so that when I went out into public, I had way too much information and not enough tact. And, and there was a time when I was in a Bible class in my private Christian school my freshman year, and my teacher, who was a very incredible woman, um, but yeah, you'll see. So she, she was talking about 2 Timothy, where it talks about how women should be quiet in church. And I, I didn't have a lot of tact, like I said, and so I believed that this was my opportunity to get in a debate with my teacher and to bring the entire class along with me and for a few days to just really create this division in the class. And I was saying things like, we have to understand that there are cultural elements in the Bible that don't necessarily apply today. And the other people were saying, well, that's not true. The Bible is literal. This is what we have to understand, or we're not going to be able to have an authoritative word of God. And then at one point, I snarkily remarked to my teacher or asked her, when was the last time that you wore a head covering when you prayed? And she didn't like that very much, so <laughs> I've since become sanctified. Anyway, I, that was my ninth grade year. And at that point, I recognized that there were these things in the text that were obviously we needed to dive deeper into. But I didn't really have a problem with the Bible or question the Bible until my senior year of high school when I was at a public school and I took a class called Launchpad. Do you guys know what Launchpad is? Launchpad is this really awesome opportunity for students in a public school to take a seminary class off campus if they want to learn more about the Bible. And it's a great program, and I really grew from it my senior year, but there was one particular teacher who came into the class, and he made it his mission for the three weeks that he was in this classroom to teach us about predestination and to really be a proponent for predestination, which, for those of you who don't maybe know what that is, the way that he described it to us and what he was trying to teach us was that there are some people who are chosen to go to heaven and the rest of people are basically destined for hell. Never. Been. Now, from my 18-year-old paradigm, and I had never been exposed to something like that, that was shocking. I literally did not have room in my theological paradigm to fit that in. And if I'm being fully honest, I cried for five days. Like, I didn't just kind of cry for five days. I really cried, wept in my car, didn't know what to do. It shook me to my core. And even as I was thinking about whether or not I was going to bring this up, I was a little bit timid because I know, I know that there are a lot of conversations. And my goal tonight is not to get into a conversation about predestination. It's really not. My goal is to, to explain to you what I took away from that season. So for five days, I'm, I'm really distraught. I'm asking my dad, who I said is a really brilliant theologian. I'm starting to watch these YouTube videos. And I think I went on a three-month kick watching YouTube videos about predestination, whether it was real, whether it wasn't. And it was a really challenging time for me because what happened was I couldn't understand how this teacher could read the same Bible that I was reading and come to such a radically different conclusion about the nature of God. It was so confusing to me. The other thing I couldn't understand, though, is that he was actually presenting me with Bible verses that were there. And there was this tension all of a sudden in my life it was cognitive dissonance. I didn't know what to do with the information I'd been given. And so tension, what it does is it pulls and it pulls and it pulls and it pulls. And like a rubber band, I literally felt like my faith was being stretched apart and I was not sure that it wasn't going to break. And it was really hard for me. What I ended up walking away from that season with after wrestling with this for a long time was 
first, I came to my own conclusions about what I believed the Bible to be saying, which I, I do think that we can come to conclusions, we can draw conclusions, and, and I did come to conclusions about that. But more than that, what I walked away with was an understanding that tension does not have to break us. If we're able to lean into the tensions that we find in the Bible, which by the way, there are tons of them, the Holy Spirit is faithful to, to guide us in that season. And not only that, but we can recognize that these tensions, kind of like a tension bridge, can actually provide this structure that supports weight. And so after a season of leaning into this tension, I was able to stand on this tension bridge and actually walk away a stronger Christian and a, a better believer in, in what I said that I believed. And I'm really grateful for that season. I really am. And I, I could go more into it, but I'll choose not to because not the time. So that was my senior year of high school. And then as I graduated from high school, I had an amazing opportunity to go and live in Paris, France as a missionary, suffering for the gospel, as a missionary in Paris, eating pan au chocolat, which is like chocolate croissant, and drinking espresso every day, and it was just so hard. But it actually, it actually really was hard, I'm going to be honest. I was young, and I, I struggled I felt really alone, and I was sacrificing some things that I really wanted in order to go there. But I wanted to give my life and that season of my life to what I believed was an important mission, which is written in the Word of God, go into the nations and make disciples. And so I was staking my life on this Word, and I was going off into the world, and I was in this season that was kind of hard. And about a third of the way through the season, I was 18 at this time, I realized, man, I've given my whole life to this gospel and I actually have never read the Bible from front to back. Like, I've never read it. And I thought I had read it. I kind of thought I had read it. I mean, I'd heard enough sermons about it. I'd listened to enough podcasts about it. I'd seen enough Instagram posts about it. Actually, I don't know if Instagram was around back then. But I'd seen all these things. And I was like, I've, I've read the Bible. But I realized I had it. And if I was going to stake my life on the Bible, I had to know what it said. And I just want to pause for a second there are probably people in this room, whether you're 16 or whether you are 70, that haven't read through the entire Bible, and I understand why. I really do. Because like I said, we have access to all these resources. We can listen to a teaching on the book of Romans seven times over. But that doesn't actually mean that we've read Romans, and there's just so much in this Bible for us. And so I'd encourage you to start now if you haven't. And when I read through this Bible the entire time, I had this really a beautiful experience with the Lord where he gave me insight into his character in a new way by looking at the whole picture. And I'm so grateful for that season because it really did set me up for the next few years, which were going to be a little bit rocky. And so I come back from France, I get into college, I have a pretty rich devotional life at this point, although I will say sometimes it went back and forth from being a little bit dry toast to being, this is so rich and nourishing. And I would get up in the morning and I would faithfully read the Bible. And I loved the Bible and I loved my faith. And so I wanted to know more about my faith. And so I started to take classes at this private Christian university I was at my senior year. I took theology and I took philosophy and really every, every variety of philosophy and theology you can take. I, I just wanted, I wanted, I wanted to eat it up. I wanted to learn what I believed and why I believed it. And that was really enriching for me. I did learn a lot of things that I still can use today that I can apply in conversations with people that have enriched my faith. But there were also things that I learned that provided big, big challenges for me. And I don't know how many of you in here are interested in taking classes like that or even care, but I assume that as you start to read the Bible, you're going to come across some of these challenges, so this is why this matters. So I'm taking these classes, and I'm reading commentaries from people about the Bible, some of them saying, okay, yeah, the Bible is definitely situated in an ancient context, but it's still the authoritative word of God, it's still, it's still rich for us, it still matters, it's still God-breathed. But some people said, this Bible is clearly so, so situated in the ancient context, it's clearly so historical that it has to only be a compilation of testimonies about God that isn't God-breathed. And Jordan talked about this a couple weeks ago, but that camp over here would be considered the really liberal view. And that was what I was being exposed to time after time after time, and article after article after article, and professor after professor after professor, and it was very challenging for me. 
Then on the other side of the spectrum, you have this kind of conservative, we call it conservative idea, which basically comes down to the Bible says it, I believe it, that's it, that settles it, right? And I couldn't quite go over here because also just it went against a lot of things that I'd grown up believing in my experiences with the Bible in the past. But I also couldn't go over here anymore because my question to these people was, well, what does the Bible say? The Bible says it. The Bible says what? Jordan brought this up a couple weeks ago, and I know that this is another really interesting point, but when the North and the South fought over slavery, we oftentimes think that it was the North that were fighting on behalf of the truth and that they were Christians and that they got it right and that the South were not God-fearing, that they were just a bunch of heathens. There were leaders in the Southern armies that loved God and thought that they were interpreting the Bible correctly. It's really challenging for us to know what to do with that, you know? And so I was like, okay, I get it. The Bible says it. I believe it. That settles it. But what does the Bible say? We can't just take it at face value. That's too, my academic mind isn't going to allow for that paradigm anymore. And so I was caught in the middle of this tension, and it was, it was really, really hard for me. And yeah, and, and honestly, what that ended up producing in my life, and I'm going to be really honest about the fruit of that is that because I could no longer really trust the Bible, because I didn't know what side of the spectrum I fell on anymore, and honestly, because I flirted with this side a lot, I began to kind of say, all right, well, I guess the Bible isn't authoritative. I guess it probably doesn't speak to my life today. It's a beautiful compilation of testimonies that speak about this God out there, but it doesn't have a weight for me today. Because I flirted with that too much, the fruit of it was that my relationship with God turned distant. And as a side note, we, we need to look at our fruit in our lives, right? Because that'll oftentimes tell us what the truth is. But the fruit of my life was that my relationship with God became distant. And I almost kind of got in this deistic relationship with God. Deism is this belief that God created the world and then stepped back and isn't involved in anything. And I didn't necessarily believe that, but I practiced my life that way. Like the way that I prayed, I didn't know how to pray anymore because if I couldn't trust the Bible anymore, I couldn't really trust God's intentions for my life because I didn't know what they were. Does that make sense? And so I was really struggling and I, I was falling not away from God, but like moving my way backward and I didn't know what to do and it was really, really confusing for me. And I started to see through everything, like every claim that anybody would make about scripture. I was like, I see right through that. That just, you, you got to back that up with something, you know? And there's a lot of conclusions that I came to as I lived in that tension. One of them I was thinking about earlier. C.S. Lewis has this quote, and I think it's C.S. Lewis. He says, to see through everything is to see nothing at all. And that's what kind of happened to me. I started seeing through everything, and then I could no longer see God. And the reality is this book, this Bible, is like it's a window, right? And we do see through it, but we see through it into the face of God. And... So that was just one thing that helped me. But I was living in this tension, and I didn't really know what to do. And, and I was struggling over and over again about how the, God, how the Bible could be, like, very, very human, but also it's authoritative. And I didn't really know what to do with that. And there's a couple things that I've come to that I just want to explain that help solve that tension for me, even though I will admit that we live in the middle of that tension because – Guess what? We live on faith. We stand on faith. And that means that we have to believe a lot of things and stand in faith about a lot of things that we don't understand. So that's, that's what we live in. But what ended up happening is I, I recognized, and Peter Enns has an article about this that's amazing, but he talks about the incarnational analogy for the Bible. So basically, people want the Bible to be something that it isn't. People over in this camp really want the Bible to be human. They want it to be ancient. They want it to be um, something that we can measure on a stick, right? And people over in this camp want the Bible to not be touched by human hands. They want it to be purely divine, not touched by human hands. What the Bible actually is, is this gift that, like Jesus, was given to us in a particular time in human history. That is purely divine, but that was communicated to us in a particular time in human history. And like Jordan said a couple weeks ago, was spoken into a historical particularity. So what we have is a Bible that is beautiful, a beautiful communicative act of God. So radical that he would love us that much that he would write the Bible in that way. So that was helpful as I was navigating that tension. And, you know, I continue to read articles in seminary that shock me. And I say, I don't know what to do with this. But what I do now is I look to Jesus. 
And here's, here's the thing, okay? Every narrative in the Bible, Old Testament all the way to the New Testament, every narrative actually in human history, it all leads up and crescendos and climaxes at the cross and at the resurrection of Jesus. Okay, so, so Jesus, when we're reading the Bible, if we're not reading the Bible in a way in which Jesus is the center of it, if we're not reading the Bible in a way that leads us to Jesus, then we're reading it wrong. And so what I started to do, recognizing that there's this, this like incarnational analogy for scripture where God's given us this God-breathed thing into human history, crazy, in the same way, Jesus... God, right? God is in heaven. The God that created the universe, he stoops down into time and space and context and then dies on a cross. That's wild. That's crazy. And if we wouldn't say that Jesus is, you know, dirty because he has human nature, then we shouldn't say that about the Bible either. Could you please throw up the John 1 slide? Thank you. So this verse just this verse is amazing. We should really meditate on this verse all the time. John 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So we have Jesus, the Word, in the beginning with God. And in the incarnation, he enters into the world in this new way, in a man called Jesus, right? And so this, this is not just... Jesus is the living word, right? And everything in this book is about Jesus. And so what this is, this is access to Jesus. This is the word within the word, right? And so that was really helpful to me, for me as I navigated this tension. I, I just came to recognize that if I was just seeing through everything and if I was just, just missing the point that this book is authoritative and it is beautiful and it does point me toward Jesus, and if I spend so much time overanalyzing it that I miss the point... That's where I went off track. Does that make sense? So, so now, and I, I'm going to be honest, like these questions still follow me to a degree, but now I get, to, I get to rest in this word, and I get to sit there, and I get to say, okay, God, this is a window into your face today. Show me Jesus. Show me Jesus. And, and it nourishes me, and it brings life. So I know that um, I've, I've talked a lot about how the Bible can be scary and I'm really sorry I'm not trying to scare you away from reading the Bible because this is church and we don't do that here. But, but I, I know that it can sometimes feel like, well, maybe ignorance is bliss, right? Like maybe it's actually better if I don't ask all these questions. And you hear these things a lot. It's actually really sad to me. A lot of people will talk down on seminary. They'll say, oh, you shouldn't go to seminary. You're going to ask so many questions and you're going to fall away from your faith. Maybe we should stay in ignorance because it's easier that way. But ignorance is not bliss when it comes to Jesus, when it comes to the kingdom, and I'll tell you why. It's because of Jeremiah 29, 13. It says, seek me and search for me, and if, well, oh man, I'm going to mess that up. Yeah, if you, if you will seek me and you will find me if you search for me with all of your heart. That's what it says, right? So I'm not suggesting that if we stop seeking God, we're not going to find him. God's grace is bigger than that. But I am suggesting that this communicative act that God has given us to show him himself, to show us himself, if we stop reading it, we've stopped. Why would we not? And he's given us this book so that we would find him. And so why would we not seek him, right? Why would we not do that? And so ignorance isn't bliss when it comes to the kingdom because we have to begin to understand what this word says so that we can understand God, right? Yeah, so... So, I actually, can you put up Psalm 27, 4, please? I'm going to move on to this verse. This is something that has also been really helpful for me on my journey of really navigating all of these questions that I've had as I've come before Jesus. It's Psalm 27, 4. One thing I've asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. In this season where I was struggling to relate with God, this was really helpful for me. First, it says to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. If you are in one of those seasons where the Bible feels like dry toast, this is your ticket. This is our invitation to enter into the Bible and to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. It's our invitation, it's our mandate, and it's amazing. And as a side note, there's this practice called Lectio Divina, and it means divine listening. 
And it is an ancient practice that the church has been using for a long time to hear the rhema word of God through the written word of God. And I think I'm going to do a Facebook Live about it because it's been really helpful for me when it comes to gazing upon the beauty of the Lord, but I can't teach it in this context. So stay tuned. But the second part of that last section of the verse, to inquire in his temple, that is what was the ticket for me. Because here we see worship represented as twofold. It's not just going and gazing upon the beauty of the Lord. We also have full permission to come to his table with questions, all the questions you could possibly ask. Every question that's floating through your mind, you have full permission to go and ask them when you're in worship with God. And you have full permission to believe that he's going to bring you an answer. He doesn't ask us to seek because he's going to leave us hanging. He says, seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Okay? So this verse was really, really helpful for me. And I just, I want to tell you again, we cannot approach the scary things in the Bible with fear. Right? As a, a little history lesson that I'm going to throw in here really fast, I promise it won't take long. But one of the things about evangelical history, which evangelical is the sub category of Christianity that we find ourselves in right now, even if we don't know it. In evangelical history, over the past hundred or so years, 1930s, evangelicals have responded to criticisms of the Bible with fear in a way that has caused them to remove themselves from cultural conversations. So higher level biblical criticism comes out in the early 1900s, and what do evangelicals do for the most part, not everyone? They get scared and they say, oh, you can't question my Bible. You can't question this. That's scary. I'm going to go hide behind this fortified fortress of fear and let you have that conversation. The problem is, is that we removed ourselves from the conversation, and so those things continue to go on without our voice. It happened again. It happened with the conversation about evolution, because people started to bring up evolution, right? And what did a lot of evangelicals do? They got scared. They removed themselves. They hid behind these fortresses of fear. And then the fruit of that, which we still see today, unfortunately, is that Christians were almost entirely removed from higher education which were the people that were on the cutting edge of this stuff. And even today, the Christian voice in higher education is almost absent. And we're the ones, Christians are the ones that planted a lot of the universities in the United States. That's really unfortunate. And so the reason that this matters, the reason that it matters that we dive deep into the scripture, that we understand what's going on, and that we don't approach it with fear, is because we have to have a voice in the conversations that are going to go on, whether we like it or not. They're going to happen. Are we going to have a voice in them? So that's really important. And I found this interesting. I was talking to my sister Liberty about this earlier. And, and in Ephesians 6, it talks about putting on the full armor of God, right? We know this. We've learned it from the time we were young. So we put on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth. And the only part of that armor of God that is really on the offensive is the sword of the spirit, right? We cannot approach everything when it comes to the Bible, from an exclusively defensive posture. We've been given an offensive word, okay? This is the sword of the spirit. And what does the sword do? do? It does this. I, I, I'm a girl. <laughs> but the sword does that. And so, like, we, we have to approach... <laughs> nailed it. Yeah, we have, to approach, we have to approach things that way, right? The sword of the spirit is offensive. We get to take ground with the sword of the spirit. So please, please, I beg you, for the sake of this nation, honestly, don't be on the defensive when it comes to scripture. Be on the offensive. Know what it says, know what the criticisms are, and know how to answer them. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Amen. Okay. All right, I'm trying to decide if there's anything else I want to say here. Before I leave you, um, last thing, last thing. When we are reading all of these different opinions on a particular text, and it gets really confusing, and it feels like babble, like I said, it can feel like babble. It can feel just like a clash of noises. I heard this analogy that was helpful for me, and maybe it'll be helpful for you. It's by this woman named Carolyn Sharp. Sometimes, instead of thinking about it as Babel, we should think about it as a music department at a large university. In a music department, you have people practicing the violin. You have a chorus practicing what they're going to sing. You have somebody um, talking to the guy that they think is cute and flirting in the hallway. You have somebody that has their phone ringing, right? And there's all of these different types of noises that are going on. And there's also different levels of proficiency among the people that are playing the violin. 
But somehow all of these noises come together and they rise up and they create this sound that is coming up from the university that kind of sounds like one. And another just more pointed analogy for where we're here right now. When we sing during worship, I know that there are some of you that are amazing singers and I know that there are some of you that are not. <laughs> but when we sing and we're singing off tune, isn't it amazing that somehow it all kind of comes together and kind of harmonizes? That doesn't mean that everybody has it right. That doesn't mean that everybody's doing it to the best of their ability. But it does mean that when we come together, we are worshiping God. When we're studying the scripture, even if we get it a little bit wrong, and even if that's scary, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish there. We don't need to be afraid of this. That's my point tonight. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish there. But I want to, I wanna finish by praying over all of you and myself. Um, Ephesians 1.17. This is a verse that has been really helpful for me. It says in 17 that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. That word revelation, it can also be translated as discovery. And so my prayer tonight is that we can live in the tension of these two things, wisdom and revelation. So God, I just thank you for this beautiful group of people. I thank you for this church, God, and I thank you for the season that you have us in. And I, I thank you that you're faithful. And I pray that as we go on this journey of engaging with the scripture and knowing what it says so we can answer the questions of the age, I pray that you would give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation, that you would increase it in our lives, God, that we would have wisdom, but we would also have the opportunity to look upon you and to receive your revelation as we look at the scriptures and see Jesus. So God, we honor you in this house. There's no one like you. There's no one like you, and I thank you for your word. It is a gift to us. In your precious name, amen.